Welcome guys, I am Major Grant Thomas and today's video is all about spacecraft structures and we're going to talk about that subsystem, all that that entails. We basically are going to talk about why the launch environment is the harshest environment for the satellite. Uh, we're going to calculate or show you how to calculate the fundamental frequency of a spacecraft and understand why this is important. Next, we're going to show you what factors determine a spacecraft's fundamental frequency. And lastly, you're going to know a little bit about environmental testing and why it's important for our structural systems. So to begin with, uh, let's look at the launch environment. So what is the launch environment exactly? So what you see here is actually uh, an acceleration profile, which is fairly typical for a launch vehicle. And what you might notice here is uh, we basically have time going across the x-axis. And then essentially you can think of it like acceleration over here on the y-axis. And what you see is these kind of sharp spikes that happen. And what these spikes actually represent are the different stages as they, as they are actually uh, burning out all of their fuel so as they to continue to accelerate the spacecraft is going to sense in this case just a little over 4 G's at this point this is like w basically when the uh, initial boosters are burning out so it's, it ends up hitting this uh, type, of, uh, type of acceleration here um, and you'll see these kind of spikes that go out and, and what basically this can start to uh, let you know is that the, um, the launch environment is actually going to be very um, intense for our spacecraft. So that's where our satellite's going to experience the max vibrational shock and acoustic loads uh, that it really can expect for its entire entire life. So this happens, uh, you know, just in the first few minutes of its, um, you know, essentially progression up into orbit. Um, and so that's going to be a really harsh time for our satellite. And so a lot of our structural design is going to be driven by survivability specifically through the launch. So let's talk about loads specifically. So what do we mean by loads? Basically, loads, we're going to talk about um, like a force uh, being applied to the spacecraft. And, and generally, when we talk about loads, we talk about something being static. Um, we can have axial loads, which are applied uh, along the axis direction. You can have lateral loads, which are applied to the side here. Or lastly, you can have torsional loads. Uh, and if these loads aren't applied in a static form, like in other words, there's not just something just pressing on our spacecraft, well, you can actually have dynamic loads applied, and oftentimes we have like forced dynamic loads, which are which are basically called vibrations, and those can be applied in the same direction, so axially, laterally, or torsionally, um, and each one of those are going to have different kinds of effect on our spacecraft. So an example of an axial load is actually shown here with the Gemini capsule, which was designed to carry two astronauts. It was being launched. Uh, on a modified Titan II, and during its first flight here, it experienced this pogo oscillation, which is kind of like an axial load, uh, an axial vibration, going from 10 to 13 hertz. Hertz is a, is a measure of frequency, so it's a cycle per second, over a 30 second period during the mid-burn of the first stage. So at 11 hertz, this shaking reached a maximum of 2.5 Gs at the payload. So basically, this is not good. Um, in fact, it says down here, this would have been unacceptable for any kind of crew that was on board. Thankfully, they weren't on board at this time, but this is a, this is a problem. So this is something that, that happens in real life and is something that we have to engineer around or figure out how to uh, survive. So. Uh, next, I'll show you an example of a lateral load. So here is a video, actually, a quick one, of Falcon Sat actually being vibrated on the on the vibe table, and so it's being vibrated at a particular frequency, which is causing these antenna that you can see on the top here to uh, shake around pretty violently. Um, and so that's something that we have to take into account. If we don't take into account the fact that these antenna are going to shake uh, during the launch. Um, then they could potentially break off. So that's something that we're going to have to take into account. So that's what lateral loading looks like. And lastly, I'll talk about torsional loading. Um, probably the best example of this is something you may or may not have seen. Tacoma Bridge, Washington, oh, opened India a few play. months ago, was built at a cost of over $6 million. But misfortune overtakes the great structure. These are some of the most amazing pictures ever recorded by a newsreel. The actual collapse of the world's third largest suspension bridge. Only a 35 mile an hour wind is blowing, but this apparently sets up a rhythmic swinging of the bridge, which increases with each swing. Thank you. 
swinging road and the suspension cables give way and plunge into the water below. Fortunately, the only casualties were a car stalled on the bridge and a dog. So that poor dog that didn't make it. But anyway, so why did why did that bridge collapse? Again, they said it briefly in the video. Hopefully you were able to hear it. Um, but essentially there was just a wind that was blowing over the bridge. Um, so what was it that caused the bridge to shake so violently? And so really what we need to introduce here is a concept called resonance. And that is basically when we um, accelerate or when we activate a particular physical system, uh, at one of its natural frequencies, you end up getting this kind of resonance, which we can exploit in positive ways, uh, like with a musical instrument. But typically what we like to do uh, when we're talking about structures is avoid these kinds of resonances. So a resonance, you can think of it this way, similar to a fundamental or natural frequency. At that particular frequency, um, you're going to get a very, for a very small input, you get a very large output. So. We're going to talk about fundamental frequency in the next few slides, so kind of introduce it here. A fundamental frequency is the lowest natural frequency, which kind of begs the question, what is a natural frequency? Well, I'm glad you asked, right? So the, the natural frequency is the frequency that an object would oscillate at or vibrate at if it was just simply given a, uh, a simple force input like an impact or potentially like if you just plucked a guitar string, how would it vibrate? And so it's going to vibrate at its fundamental frequency or its lowest natural frequency. This is very, looks very similar to what you might see for a guitar string. What you may not know is that there's actually other harmonic frequencies as you move up. So we have like a second harmonic and a third harmonic and a fourth harmonic. And so, so essentially these relate to other natural frequencies. So we have other natural frequencies for our particular structure, whatever it may be. And so what we find is if we accelerate our object or if we apply some force to our object at that particular rate, at that frequency of a natural frequency for an object, we're going to get a very large output for a very small input. So mathematically, we can solve for that fundamental frequency by basically relating two different uh, structural characteristics. And those characteristics are essentially our stiffness, or K, so that's going to be our spring constant. constant. So um, in any mechanical system, we're going to have some sort of uh, spring constant. This value will be given to you like an exam. We'll say, hey, this is what the spring constant is for, for a particular material. But it's driven by the material characteristics. And it's going to have a particular mass. So by using those two uh, different um, physical constants, really, or characteristics, we can figure out what the fundamental frequency or the lowest natural frequency is for our particular system. So here's another video of an example of what happens when you vibrate a system at that particular fundamental frequency. And what you can see here, uh, before I hit play on the video, is that there's basically, the, there's a, there's a base rod here that all of these small slender rods are actually mounted into. And they're all connected down here at the base. And then you have these masses, the green, the yellow, the red, the red, the yellow, the green, um, that are all identical to each other. So all of these masses are identical to one another. And what you're going to see, actually, is as he runs this experiment, he's going to articulate one of the, uh, uh, basically one of these rods. And that vibration is going to go down this rod and kind of vibrate this base at a particular rate. But what you'll see is, for the respective rod that has the same natural frequency as the input rod, it's going to shake violently, while the other two rods are going to remain relatively constant. But they'll, they'll still be moving. They'll still have some vibration that's, uh, that's in, you know, impinging upon it, but it's not going to necessarily cause the same kind of violent reaction. So I'll let the video play here. It's pretty cool. So you can see the red one shaking violently when he touches the one red one. Notice the yellow is just shaking really violently with the uh, particular frequency of the, um, of the other yellow rod. And lastly, just the green one shaking. So the red and the yellow are experiencing that same input frequency, but it doesn't have the same result on the net system. So in general, we're going to want to avoid that kind of situation for our spacecraft. 
So here's what you might see. Um, our launch vehicle might have a vibration profile. It's going to excite all sorts of frequencies essentially in this region here. And if we had the situation where our, our, the fundamental frequency of our spacecraft was, with, was within that region, that's going to be a problem. So what we really want to do is move the fundamental frequency of our spacecraft out beyond that of what our launch vehicle is going to excite. So really we want the F max or the frequency max of our launch vehicle to be less than the fundamental frequency of our satellite. So that way, essentially, our satellite um, is not being affected by those two things. Well, in general, how do you do that? Well, you can change one of two parameters. You can either change the stiffness or the mass. A lot of times the stiffness is going to be given by a particular material, so usually what you want to do is decrease the mass. And by decreasing the mass, that's going to shift our fundamental frequency further up into these higher regimes, and so we get um, we have a fundamental frequency that's going to be uh, essentially uh, greater than that of the fundamental frequency, the max fundamental frequency that we would experience from our launch vehicle. So let's talk about testing, and so our last slide, and we'll be we'll be done here. So spacecraft environmental testing, really, we're looking for two different things. We're either trying to evaluate the strength of our spacecraft. Uh, really, what we're trying to find is the minimum necessary strength to ensure that our structure is going to hold together. And we also want to look for a particular stiffness, meaning the minimum necessary stiffness to ensure that our spacecraft remains stable during launch. So here's an illustration, like a cut open view of a Soyuz rocket. And here's our spacecraft as it would be mounted um, as it's going up to orbit. So you can see it's kind of on the top of the rocket here within this fairing. And what we want to do is have this, the spacecraft's gonna shake, but we want that shaking to be such that it's not gonna hit the, the walls of the fairing here and potentially damage the spacecraft. So we gotta get a stiffness that's high enough that it does the job for us. So that's basically structures in a nutshell. Thank you much, and we'll see you next time. Hi, I'm Major Grant Thomas, and I'm gonna be doing your structures tutorial. Here we go. All right, so for today's tutorial, um, I actually, took this um, problem from the Spring 15 GR3 with Answers, uh, page 7. So this is a page uh, from a GR, and this is similar to what you might see uh, for a structures problem on an exam. So this is not an exhaustive tutorial, but that should give you an idea of the kinds of problems that you might be asked to solve. So the first question is, um, it says, circle all that apply. Why is it important to determine the fundamental frequency of a satellite? And then you have four choices. So we're expecting you to circle all that apply, so you might circle more than one here. Um, let's see. So the first uh, answer says, uh, to ensure that the satellite can fit into the payload fairing on top of the rocket. So um, this is not the right answer because um, you basically, uh, when we're talking about fundamental frequency, we're not really talking about volume as much as we're talking about mass. So specifically, fundamental frequency is a relationship between stiffness and mass. And um, this, this question, uh, the part A here is saying, um, why can't we, talking about fitting it into the payload fairing on top of the rocket, that's a volume kind of question, so that one's not going to apply. All right, so part B. Um, why is it important to determine the fundamental frequency of a satellite, Part B, to ensure that the frequency does not interfere with communication. So this is uh, not correct because it's talking about a different kind of frequency. This is the frequency uh, with, that we might deal with when we're talking about signal to noise. Um, that's going to be different than the, uh, the, the fundamental frequency. All right, Part C. Um, why is it important to determine the fundamental frequency of a satellite? To help calculate the effects of the satellite propulsion system at the end of life. All right, so this one's not the correct answer because um, we don't really have any kind of relationship uh, that we have explicitly drawn here between stiffness and mass and the propulsion end of life. Um, sometimes, usually when we're talking about end of life with these kinds of questions, we're really talking about the uh, EPS system. We're not talking about that here, so this one's also not going to be correct. All right, so the correct answer is actually D. Um, it's to determine that the satellite will not be damaged in the launch environment. Um, this is basically so that the, um, the satellite is going to have a fundamental frequency, which is going to be its lowest natural frequency, and we don't want that to be activated by the launch vehicle. The launch vehicle is actually um, going to swing through multiple different frequencies, um, and so we don't want the launch vehicle to activate this fundamental frequency. So the correct answer in this case would be D. All right. So 
that's the, an example of the kinds of problems that you would see in terms of a word problem with structures. Let's talk about an actual math problem here. Okay, so this one said, given the following satellite and three launch vehicle options, which launch vehicle provides the most margin? And then what is that margin? Um, and then it gives you some, um, some uh, actual uh, givens here. It tells you that the satellite mass is 110 kilograms and its structural stiffness constant is 9.5 times 10 to the 6 newtons per meter. And then it gives you several different launch vehicles. Well, uh, to begin with, what I would do for this problem is calculate what the fundamental frequency of the satellite is going to be. Um, and for that, we actually have an equation on our equation sheet. Um, the fundamental frequency is going to be equal to 1 over 2 pi times the square root of k over m, where k is our stiffness and m is our mass. So if we're going to plug in the values that we have here given, that would be uh, 9.5. 0.5 times 10 to the 6 newtons per meter divided by uh, 110 kilograms. Uh, if you do the math there, uh, we'll see. I don't know if you can see my, my calculator here. I'll bring it over here to this sign. Uh, you'd have 1 over 2 pi times the square root of the quantity 9.5 uh, times 10 to the 6 newtons per meter divided by 110. And I got that the fundamental frequency here was 46.77 hertz. All right, so that's the fundamental frequency of our satellite. So that number basically means um, when we are resonating at this 46.77 hertz, um, if, the, if the launch vehicle is vibrating at that frequency, um, our spacecraft is going to be going crazy because that's that's basically its natural frequency or its fundamental frequency its lowest natural frequency okay so now we can answer these questions about margin so let's look at these three um launch vehicles and for all of these problems basically what we're going to want is we're going to want the fundamental frequency of our spacecraft to be greater than the fundamental frequency of the launch vehicle so this one's our satellite the fundamental frequency of the satellite needs to be greater than the fun f max of a launch vehicle. Well, um, we can actually look here at the problem, and we can see that two of these values, this 43 and the 45, are both <clears throat> less than this 46. This 48 is not going to work altogether because this this Atlas V is actually going to have a negative margin. So if I was to to calculate the Atlas V um, margin. That would be our spacecraft fundamental frequency minus the fundamental frequency max of our um, of our launch vehicle here, um, and in that case, you're going to get a negative value, right? So what is you could do it here? 46.77 minus 48. I got negative 1.23 hertz. Um, okay, and so. Which one of these is going to have a better margin? Let's look at the Falcon first. So Falcon margin, that'd be 46.77 hertz minus uh, 45 hertz. And that's going to be 1.77 hertz. And then the Atlas, sorry, the Antares, or Antares uh, margin would be that same 46.77 of our spacecraft minus the 43, uh, which in this case would be 3.77 hertz. And that's going to be the best margin. So this is going to be the best rocket, the best launch vehicle, um, because it's basically going to give us the most margin. Falcon would also work. It's got a positive margin. Um, but it's not as much as the Antares, so we're going to go with the Antares. Uh, so that's why the answer here is 3.77, and Antares is circled. All right. So that wraps up our structures video. Um, I hope you found that tutorial useful. Um, the main thing to remember is that you want to keep the fundamental frequency of your spacecraft greater than that of the launch vehicle, and you should be good to go. Um, the way that you can change your fundamental frequency is to by either increasing the stiffness
or decreasing the mass. Increasing the stiffness is oftentimes not something that you can do um, because you're going to be limited by the materials that your spacecraft is made of. Um, but decreasing the mass, um, that is something that you could possibly do. And that might be one way that you could uh, increase the fundamental frequency of your spacecraft um, and more easily get to orbit on a wider variety of launch vehicles. That's it. See you next time.